Hello, it's Duncan. Last week we simplified our code, in particular our tests, by moving side effects to the edge of the system. This week I'll show a powerful technique for hiding the remaining side effects inside a function. This turns actions into calculations and allows us to test them without complicated setup and teardown. The effectively invisible side effects are good enough. I'll just run all the tests before I check in. So that's clean tests. Take quite a time, which is why I, oh. All right, let's have a look. Delete items directly, delete items HTTP with no HTMX, delete items HTTP, delete, okay, so delete items is broken. That's not good. Did I run all the tests after I changed the app? Or was it just those of the core? Hmm, let's go back to the app and try and remember what I did. Delete items with ID. Let's have a look at that test failure. This is delete no items doesn't save stock list. Here we're saying we ask the app to delete an empty set of item IDs. And then we ask the fixture to check the stock list is whatever the original stock list was. And it turns out here that wasn't the case. We have actually saved the item. Hmm. Oh, I'm an idiot. We're passing in now. That's to say the time that we are making this request. We're creating an updated stock list with that time, and then we're saying, is the updated stock list the same as the stock list? Well, obviously it's not going to be, because now will be later than the one we just loaded. So I messed that up when I refactored it. I think what we should be saying is, if the update stock list dot items is not equal to the stock list dot items. That true? Phew. And the reason so many tests were failing is that delete items acceptance contract is a contract, which is to say it's a test that is implemented by a bunch of other tests. So delete items directly, for example, it says, well, I asked the app to delete them straight away. But if I go back to the HTTP version, then delete with HTTP says, well, we'll make a request to the delete items route with the form data in it. OK, well, thank goodness for acceptance tests. We can now commit that. And I think if I make an amend commit here, before I push, we can pretend that it never happened. So this is move to functional core imperative shell in app actions and stock. In the last episode, we refactored our stock code. There's a class here to move IO to the edges. Let's say we load here and then save here by extracting a calculation here of maybe update that works out whether we do want to update the stock list and returns a decision whether the code that called it should save an update or do nothing. And that lets us write some really nice functional tests here where we could create an initial stock list and then just call maybe update with different parameters and see what it returns. So it returns do nothing here, uh, but in some cases it returns save or update. That's in contrast to our original test, which is down here, which because it tests the whole of stock list, load and update stock list, has to capture the side effects somehow. So we have to set up some in-memory items and we have to run in transactions and we have to sense what was actually saved by loading it again from the in-memory items. So there's this complicated interaction between the fixture that we set up here, all the state that the test requires, and a particular test. And we only have one test here because that interaction is so complicated. Looked at in terms of actions and calculations, we have a couple of actions here, this load and update stock list and this load. So they have to happen in a certain order. What we're going to do today is translate these actions into a calculation. And we're going to do that by hiding the effects of the action from being visible externally. I think that will make sense later on, so let's just get on with it. The first thing I'm going to do is take this state here, which is currently in loading and updating stock tests, and push it into another class. And I'm going to call that a data class, and I'm going to call it fixture, because that's what we call test state. And the AI is having a go for us, but I don't think that's what we want. I'm just going to say, let's take these things. And then if we remove the private, put in the commas, then we're almost a data class if we add the type parameter. So there's that one. And OK, so initial stock list items and stock were fields of this class, but now they're fields of fixture. And so they can't now be seen in this test, but they could if we were to create a fixture. So I'll say val fixture is fixture. And now we can say with that fixture, 
to make it inside the block a receiver like that and that compiles and passes the test. Note that we're now doing manually what JUnit does automatically when it runs a test. Ordinarily JUnit creates a new instance of this class here before it runs each one of these test methods. Any properties of this class, which is to say the fixture, are created fresh and are available as the receiver, let's say this, inside any of our tests. What we've done now is in the test itself we've created a new fixture and we've made it available as the receiver with with. That's this one here. Now though within this function we can mutate the fixture, we can do what we like with it, because it's not visible outside this function. And that's our way of turning actions, changing things within the fixture, for example, reading from or writing to the memory items, into a calculation. Right then, with respect to understanding what's going on in this test, this fixture isn't now very helpful. For example, we have to go up here to see what the initial stock list is. So for now at least, we'll just get rid of it. We'll take these things here, put them into here, and that allows us to get rid of that and go to the end, get rid of one of those, reformat. And now everything is in this function, which would compile if I got rid of that. It's now a bit long, but it does pass the tests. Can we shorten it into one screen for before we go on? Well, I think we can. First of all, I'm suspicious about these minus days one and plus days one. I don't think these are required at all, so I'm just gonna take them out. They were left over from something at some point. That's good. And now, in fact, I don't think we care about what the actual items are. We care that there are some and that we set them up and then that they change here. So I think I'm going to take this thing and move it out as a field, maybe even the top level, and we'll just call it some items. And some is a good word to use when we don't really care what these things are. Still good, naturally. So let's go down. We are on one screen now. Let's look at the function of these lines. This first one here is setting up our initial stock list. And then we need to set up some in-memory items in order to create a stock here with this in-memory items. And that's the stock we're going to talk to in here. But after this has done its job, we're going to go back to the items and we're going to load from those to check that the updated stock list was saved into the items. So this is all just set up for two actions here, our load and update stock list and our load. But there's also another thing in here which is sort of actually, it's this assert equals, and they're actually because they'll throw an exception, and if that's true, for example, then this code here, this bit, will never be run. So on a bit of a whim, I'm going to remove the assert equals from inside these blocks to outside. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to take this thing and assign it to a variable, and that's our result. I'm going to return the result from here. That allows me to say val result equals items in transaction, and now I can pull this out of there for the same effect. And a nice side effect of that is because this is less indented, I can make these on one line. Okay, we'll do the same thing here. So we'll say this is a variable. And what's this? Well, it is the next state. It's the state of the system after we've run the tests. So I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to return it from here. And I'm going to say val next state is that thing and pull this out of there. Right. Marvellous. Inline that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the two asserts to be together. So we'll do all of the actions here, followed by all the checking down here. Oh, and it seems I didn't inline that one. Now then we can group these lines according to their scope. So really this unexpected updated result, we can cut out of there and put down there. And this items and stock, we can take out of there and put there. I wonder why IntelliJ thought that I didn't need the types of those other variables, but do need the type of that, because I don't. Why have I grouped these things together? Well, it's because items isn't required down here and neither is stock. So the actions that happen to items, the loading and the saving that happens in here and the loading again that happens in here, are entirely confined to these lines. So if I take these and make a method out of them, and I think that can even be outside this class, I'm going to call this do load and update just to distinguish it from the operation on the actual stock. So in here we have something that takes a stock list and a time, and it sets up all the fixture stuff in here that it needs to call this operation and check its effect. And because that is all in here, 
This is now just a calculation. It will always return the same pair, given the same initial stock list and the same instant. All of the non-purity is hidden inside here. Because these are local variables, nobody can ever see them, and that makes this into a calculation. OK, going back, we can see that we destructure the result on the next date and the call from here. So we have them both available to assert equals on here. And as a nice side effect, we can actually say assert all, giving this a little bunch of lambdas, which means that even if this assert fails, we will be able to tell whether this one passed or failed. We can see that, for example, if we make that minus two and run the tests. There you are, look, it's two of them. Assertion failed error and assertion failed error. Brilliant. Just return that to get the test to pass. This pair is all very well, but a little bit cryptic. Let's see what we can do about that. We can fix that if we just make ourselves a little data class. So I'm going to say data class do load and update result. Our result is a bit confusing there because we have another type of result. I think we'll use outcome. And the AI is suggesting result and next state, which is good. I do think though the next state can't actually be a failure. It can only really be a stock list. So let's take that, go to there. And we'll go down into do load and update and say, I want you to return a do load and update outcome given the result and the next state on failure. Well, we know that can't happen, so we'll put an error in there. And in fact, thinking about it, I'll gonna take that out of there and put it into there. Should not fail. And now it's complaining that we are still saying returning a pair, so we can fix that. And now if we go back up here, I think the expected update result, we can remove the as success from there and we can put it into there. Good. So let's see how readable this test is. We set up an initial stock list. I think that's now short enough to move on to one line if we got rid of that. We set up some sort of time, which is the first time the next day. Now we've pulled everything together. I think it's obvious that that should really be the very first instant of the day. And that does work. Now we make a calculation of what would happen if we loaded and update that stock list given that time. We then say what we expect is this stock list and we check that stock list is both the result here and the next date here. I think we might rename now to be first instant of next day. And now the thing that stands out is this horribleness here. What I'm really aiming for in these tests is something that I might be able to show to the customer of the software team, a business analyst, say, and have them squint and say, yes, that's what the behavior of our stock should be. This map then really isn't helping. But if we were to take this thing as a method, we'll put it up at the top and we'll call it with quality decreased by. Uh, it turns out there's another one, which is handy. Let's get rid of that. And now let's go and see this. This is taking in a stock list, but I think really wants the items. So let's make this take items, which is a list of item. Not a great refactor this, but I can take that. And now I want to make this a parameter as well. So that is my quality change. That seems to have crashed IntelliJ. Ho hum. Well, it is the early access, so I guess we'll let it off. Now let's go to the callers. This should be initial stock list items, which in this case is just some items. Maybe that would be clearer. I don't know. Go back here, and now we'll make this the receiver. So that's now a list of items with quality decreased by something. Go and see it in context. And so our expected updated result is a stock list with the items is some items with the quality decrease by one. I think we might now remove all the argument names, put those onto one line, and we have quite a sweet little test. That passes. And now that our test is so much simpler and all in one place, I think we might be able to duplicate that and write the test for does not update stock if last modified today. So in this case, our boundary is an initial stock list saved at the very beginning of the day. So we'll move those to zero, zero. And the other boundary is the very last instant of that day. So that will be our 23, 59, 59, 
0.999, as many as we can be bothered. And this is now last instant of same day. We load an update, the initial stock list on the last instant of the same day, and the expected updated result. So let's say that is expected not updated result, and that should be our initial stock list. The thing we get back should be the expected not updated result, and the state should still be that. Are we right? Wonderful. This technique of hiding all of our mutation inside a function is a really powerful one. Here it's happening in memory, but we can make it work with I.O., providing nothing outside the function can see the effects of our writes or change the effects of our reads. So we can often write into a private temporary directory or set up a whole database table that nothing else knows about. Effectively invisible side effects are good enough. On the subject of effectively invisible, one thing that occurs to me is that while we're looking at the next state here, we don't know for certain that this code doesn't save the stock list that it's just loaded. Just that what we get when we load is the same thing as we're saved. Looking at the code, you can see here that when the decision is do nothing, we don't save, but it would be nice for the test to enforce that. So next week, we'll see how to change this code to check that. And we'll also look at a technique that allows us to document the different phases of a test. You probably work with somebody who puts in given, when, then comments, maybe even with a space there. I personally prefer code over comments, so we'll look at a cute trick that allows us to remove those. If you'd like to see that, then subscribing to the channel is the easiest way. If you're clicking around anyway, then hit the thumbs up. And if you like this content, then I think you'll enjoy the book that I wrote in that price called Java to Kotlin Refactoring Guidebook, details of which are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.